Hi, I'm Dave Fornell, the editor of Imaging Technology News, and I'm here at RSNA 2015 in Chicago. I have with me uh, ITN contributing editor Greg Fryer, uh, who's been uh, in the industry. And what RSNA is this for you? 30 seconds. 30 second. And uh, I want to talk about some of the key trends in technology that we've seen this year at RSNA. And uh, I wanted to start off with you. I think uh, you saw some interesting trends in uh, enterprise imaging. Well, enterprise imaging is really the, the message that we saw in almost every booth of every provider of what used to be PACs and risk-driven systems as well as you get your uh, providers such as Cerner and, and uh, McKesson and others that are, that are more on the EMR or EHR side. But really what I find very interesting, if we're going to get into something that's really exciting, we, let's look into a little bit of deep learning, deep learning type algorithms and what they might be able to provide. If we're looking towards the future, if we're looking towards what this is going to become, we're looking at a consolidation of different silos, the, the so-called areas where there was radiology, cardiology, the so-called and the, and the oscopies, which are now supposed to be blended more together as we start to look at EMR type systems that, that coalesce all of these data sources together. There has to be some way of making sense of all this and increased efficiency, increased effectiveness. What excites me about this is that we're now seeing companies such as IBM and, and, its, and its merger with Merge Health, as well as startup companies like Enlytic, which have come together with ideas about how they can develop deep learning algorithms that will be able to find patterns in the disease in archives, large archives, and teach these kinds of, al teach these algorithms to learn so that they learn more and more about how to see the early signs of disease. So we're seeing this not only from the perspective of the radiologist, but I think that this is a great collaborative tool because what you're doing is you're bringing these different, these different disciplines together and, you're, and the AI has the potential to be able to help radiologists not only see things within the, uh, within the images more effectively and efficiently, but be able to understand all these other kinds of data that they're being asked to understand from pathology. They're not pathologists, but they would be able to be given a heads up as to what to look for in the patterns that appear in the data that they're being sent. So this is a great collaborative tool as well. And sure, it's a, it's a future tool, but it's one that is now starting to show the signs of taking, getting some traction. So I think that that's a real advantage. And then, you know, if you look at Cerner, I think what their, their message was, PACs and RIS were great during the days when, when radiology really dominated the electronic medical record because that was the electronic medical record at the time because images required storage, required transfer and, and transmittal amongst uh, different positions and different places within the enterprise. But, but really EMR is the, is the bringing together of all the different disciplines. And if you're going to have a future in which radiology is going to be a team player, it's going to be driven by the EMR, and that's really what Cerner was saying. And you saw this reflected in other places. Uh, Sector had its enterprise image management uh, system, which demonstrated how images came together for, to plan patient management. And I think the opportunity there is to make radiology a part of that team. So we saw that. Uh, we saw Philips and how they're bringing together tools one tool specific like measurement assistant which is specific to the radiologist and then oncology dashboard which is specific to the oncologist. These tools work together like the individual disciplines should be working together as parts of the team. So we saw that coming together too and I think Philips has a lot, had a lot of, of interesting developments. You saw some with the ultrasound side there Philips as well. I did. Uh, with the Philips ultrasound they introduced uh, commercially uh, the Lumify system. It's a uh, pocket ultrasound system. It actually works off of a uh, Android-based phone or tablet device. Uh, all of the technology to do beam forming and the image formation is actually in the transducer itself. You just plug it into your power port and it immediately comes up on the screen. You have to download an app onto your phone, which is free. And they're going with the subscription model to where you could turn your uh, cell phone into an ultrasound uh, device uh, for about 200 bucks a month for a subscription. So uh, for point of care, that's, uh, that's really something. And in terms of point of care uh, ultrasound, I, I've seen several innovations. Uh, Lumify was probably the most interesting where you could uh, use app-based ultrasound on your cell phone. But uh, vScan came out a few years ago with uh, GE. GE said that they're well over 15,000 units that they've sold now, uh, which a lot of people, when they first came to market with a pocket ultrasound, they said, who's going to buy this? They sold quite a few of these systems. And it's really an indication of where uh, ultrasound is and how it's greatly expanded uh, medical imaging uh, in the hands of uh, non-sonographers. 
uh, Fujifilm and Sonosight, they uh, launched their iViz at this show. The iViz is a handheld system that you could actually fit in your hand very comfortably or you can set it up on the table. It's a uh, very small tablet device. Uh, you have a couple different transducers that can plug into it. It's also uh, enabled so you can send uh, information to the packs uh, or even email. Uh, everything is driven so when you have it in the hand holder, it's very ergonomic. You could actually move your thumb around to do all the controls with one hand while you're uh, scanning with the other. But it's also Bluetooth enabled. So their thought is that this could be a point of care device, uh, not just for imaging, but any Bluetooth enabled uh, devices as you might see at HIMSS uh, in a couple months, where you could do everything from temperature, uh, blood sugar monitoring. Uh, they also have an ECG 12 lead uh, strap that goes onto the patient. You could do a, a 12 lead with a report that auto generates uh, using the system. So it'll go beyond imaging in a couple years. Uh, Konica Minolta also released a similar system, uh, a small pocket ultrasound in uh, 2014, and it was again on the show floor here. Uh, in terms of premium ultrasound, uh, Philips, uh, their EPIC system, they introduced anatomical imaging, and this is the first time they showed it as a commercial launch here at uh, RSNA. And anatomical imaging, they can take the 3D, uh, transducer, they can take an entire volume. Instead of being uh, dependent on the user's uh, experience in scanning and knowing the exact angles and how to get something maybe out of a heart or a liver, uh, when you collect the 3D volume, you have a box of data, uh, the system will automatically segment everything to the exact views that uh, physicians need. Um, other premium systems I saw out there was uh, the E95 from GE Healthcare. And the E95 was introduced earlier this year. The image quality on the E95, which is now going to be their flagship uh, product for cardiology, um, the image quality is uh, near uh, CT quality. Mm, okay, and we're seeing a lot of advance in, in CT as well, Dave. I mean, if we look at uh, where we've been over the last 10 years and we see this progression, and there's it's almost a two-tiered kind of approach to things that the companies are doing. One, of course, is pushing back the, the capabilities of, what, where, uh, of the turf that you can now uh, address in CT. And I think that the uh, dual source uh, from Siemens, where uh, we looked at that primarily as a dual source and dual energy, but I think that now we're looking at how dual source is being moved into the emergency department because of its extremely fast uh, reconstruction times, the, how you can stop, let's say if you had a patient who came in with chest, complaining of chest pain, you can identify what that is. Let's say if it's, it's a cardiac event, that patient needs to go into the hospital. But if it's not a cardiac event, you don't want to put that person in the hospital overnight. You want to reduce the amount of, of resources that you have to dedicate to them. Well, this is an expensive scanner, but if you can put in a scanner that's going to keep you from having to build a wing to a hospital, an additional wing, you've saved a lot of money in the long run. And this is that long view that people are starting to take. But then you take a look also at what, so you take a look at the potential of dual beam, which is essentially, you know, as, as it was presented when it was first brought out by Siemens 10 years ago, is the dual energy side of things where you get the composition of tissues. You're now able to, from Siemens again, is to split the beam and create different energy x-rays from a filter that's put into the beam itself so you don't need two different energy imaging chains. And, and you're right about spectral CT being something of real interest. The question is, how do you use it well and you use it in a routine manner? Pulmonary embolism. Well, and, and the thing stones. is, it's, you can have something that you can, that is a capability, mm -hmm. but is it easy to use? Mm -hmm. And that's where Magic Glass comes in because they made it part of their pack system, and as a result, they've made it they've made it easy to use. And now Spectral CT is is from the Phil's perspective. May, a, able to make that jump into the routine practice. And so we look at CT now, we had talked a little bit about uh, CareStream mm -hmm. and that they have an ortho system, I think you saw that. I did, uh, it's a cone beam CT system, uh, got the stand inside of it, uh, it actually has a donut that can flip down, goes, it has a door off to the side, you could step into it and uh, it'll scan, open the door, the patient come out, they could flip it up, go up, they have a special chair, you could put arms into it. And it's supposed to be uh, an entry level uh, CT system for uh, orthopedics to avoid the need for a CT scanner at uh, maybe something that'll be in the ballpark of uh, a third of the cost of a CT scanner. Today. What, what I think is really interesting about this is that it's potentially going to change the workflow within a department. You're not looking, they're not going to exclude hospitals, but I think the idea here is that you're able to put it into, let's say, a physician's office or a sports medicine clinic. Now, if I were to go in and I think I, I broke my arm, they would send me to their x-ray department, okay, because they've got an x-ray system right there and they'll have an answer for me very shortly and they'll be able to treat me that same day 
But if you need a CT, you've got to be referred out right now. If you can get a CT actually built into the department where they can send you for a CT, the workflow completely changes. Now you're going to get an answer just like you would if you were going for x-ray. This uh, cone beam CT system that they've introduced, it also has iterative reconstruction. Mm -hmm. It has uh, advanced visualization algorithms that they built in. Uh, you can do uh, full 3D reconstructions uh, that are even color coded that you could rotate around it just as if it was done on a 16 or a 64 slice system. Yeah, and it's interesting too is that this, is, this actually speaks to a trend in itself where you're starting to look at CT type technologies that are beginning to transition into specialty applications. The coning breast CT scanner, which has been in the works for years now, but the idea is simple. I can tell you that from what I've heard, breast compression is not something that women look forward to when they go for their mammography. You know, screening mammography is, and I have to be careful to say this right, the coning breast CT is only right now approved by the FDA for uh, diagnostic purposes. So you aren't able to do this on a screening uh, basis, but the potential exists to be able to get to that. But you can avoid the compression with this because the breast is you lie flat on this, on this table and there's no compression necessary. So the painfulness of that is gone. I, I think we were talking too a little bit about how you begin to expand into areas uh, that were potential, but really now finally the routine is, is available. We saw something at, at GE with Vios Works, which is a cardiac application. Maybe you've seen that? I did. Uh, from a cardiology perspective, only about 1% of exams with MRI uh, in the United States are done on MRI for MRAs. And uh, GE is really hoping to kind of push the envelope because it's a difficult exam to do. It's a, there's a lot of protocol setups. Uh, you have to get very specific views of the heart. You have to have three different views. Um, this system with uh, Vios Works, it uh, automatically does a 3D uh, full chest volume, and off of that they're able to slice and dice whatever they need um, because they have the data set available immediately. Um, it can do uh, anatomy, function, uh, it can do flow, and it's all from a single breath hold, uh, eight minute scan. Uh, traditional scans right now could take up to 70 minutes, uh, so they're hoping that uh, this would actually make MRI a much more attractive uh, cardiac option, especially for patients who have to go back for repeat exams uh, with congenital heart or with uh, heart failure. Um, and I think probably what they, they may have mentioned to you about how they're doing the computing, which is not your conventional kind right. of computing right at the, at the machine. Yeah, I mean, right now I think it's about 200 megabytes as a standard MRA exam, but uh, using this full volume, chest volume set, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of like 20 gigabytes. So you can't just upload this to your packs uh, and not clog up the system. So they're actually developing a cloud computing platform that's specific to this uh, MRA system. Well, what's exciting about that is, and you think about this is, and I keep on, I think about the cloud as a place to store things and pull things down from. What they're starting to look at this now as a means of using, of bringing computing power to where you need it. Right. And they're talking about supercomputing power. And that's where that speed comes from. When you say seven to eight minutes for the acquisition, maybe even, and if you talk to them, they'll probably, they'll go with 10 minutes but they'll be able to reconstruct these, these uh, data that couldn't possibly be done except on a supercomputer in that kind of speed and they're using the cloud to do it. Yes. Yeah. So, what else have you seen in MRI? Well, you know, if you look at MRI, you're seeing a lot of advanced clinical applications. Uh, lung MR, and, and specifically at Toshiba. Here's something where if you take a picture of the, if you try to image the, the lungs because of the, of the very, you know, very low signal that you're getting from these lungs, you're not able to do it very well with MR. But what they have developed there at Toshiba is an ultra short echo, so that you're able to make the most of that low signal and you're getting lung MR images, and I saw them, and I, these were pretty impressive. They were equivalent to, again, going back to CT, and I think CT is the gold standard to a lot of things that are compared to it, as it was with, with, um, with ultrasound. That's here, with here we're seeing it with, with MR. With, with CT, the kind of pathology that you're seeing on an MR is almost equivalent to, and I could see it in the comparisons there too. So you see that, I think there's a lot of emphasis going on in efficiency, effectiveness, uh, that are going on at, at Siemens with simultaneous multi-slice, which accelerates the imaging. GoBrain, which is something that will get down the actual imaging time down to maybe five minutes in MR, which is a really great advance. And then at Philips, they're talking about M. Dixon. And I've heard M. Dixon referred to as modified Dixon, um, multi-point Dixon, but really what it comes down to, it's a, it's a development of a mathematical modeling technique that has evolved over the years and has now been developed so that, and, and put in such a way that you can get very complex scans done very efficiently and so bring down what maybe was 30 minutes down to maybe just 10. So we're seeing a lot of movement towards efficiency, effectiveness, and in areas 
whether you've never seen it before, as in Biosworks, as you mentioned. Well, thank you very much for your insights, Greg. Uh, I wanted to let viewers know that there'll also be uh, technology reports on enterprise imaging, MRI, and CT that uh, Greg Fire has put together at this RSNA with uh, reports uh, from the vendor booths. And also there'll be an editor's choice video on some of the most innovative new technologies uh, at uh, RSNA 2015.